What up, y'all? What's up, guys? How are you? Legendary Talks, um, episode 72. We have uh, my good old friend, DJ Cassidy. I'm very excited to chat with him. You know. You know what we do over here. Black and white. How you guys doing? Is that... What's up, Cannon? Oh, Cassidy's right on time. Perfect. Oh, no, wait, that's not Cassidy. Sorry, thought it was Cassidy, false alarm. Um, Cannon, how are you? How's everyone doing today? What are we drinking? I'm vodka cranberry. Hold on, I have another request. I think that's Cassidy. Let me see. Yes, perfect. Right on time. What up? Sup? How are you? I'm good now that I see you. I have a question for you. Yeah. Are you on the list? Uh, yeah, it's Cassidy, Durango, Milton, Willie, Podell, plus oh. one. Yes, I have it. Thank you. Please come uh, in. Thank you. Please join. Thank How are you God. doing, first of all? How are you feeling? I didn't want to have to call Josie Sejour to get me in. Exactly. Like back in the day. Um, first of all, thank you for doing this. Um, thank you for having me. I'm psyched. Getting you, getting you to do this was harder than getting Beyonce to do it. No way. I, I asked you 10 times what? and you're like, you know. Um, I genuinely feel like I've been waiting for the invitation. Swear to God, not just saying that. I oh feel God, like I've- actually, I've, I've actually a million times. Anyway, no, I feel like we brushed by the conversation. Okay. But now I got well, a formal invitation. Can well, you see I'm me glad. okay? Is my yeah, angle you're, good? Yes, you're great, lighting's great. Well, I'm glad you're doing it and I'm glad you're here and I can't wait to chat about many things. Um, first of all, you and I have known each other, I was thinking about you today, for well over 20 years, right? I think since 1999. Yeah, okay, so that's more than 20 years. So um, I want, so maybe people joining right now don't really know, you are you know, one of the most successful DJs of the last two decades. Um, you know, Thank you. List, list a couple things of your resume. I know people <sighs> hate doing this, but a couple highlights of your um, resume quickly. Who hates listing highlights? Some people do. You don't, obviously, so go. No, I don't hate listing highlights. I was the first DJ to ever DJ a presidential inauguration. I DJed both of Barack Obama's inaugurations. I was the first DJ to ever DJ at the White House. I DJed President Obama's 50th birthday and, and the First Lady's 50th birthday, shared a stage with Beyonce, Prince, Stevie Wonder, and many others. When Oprah Winfrey opened up her school in South Africa on New Year's Eve 2006, I flew to South Africa to DJ that celebration with Oprah and Nelson Mandela and Quincy Jones and Cicely Tyson and Sidney Portier and Tina Turner and Tyler Perry, whom I met there. And then he bought the Delta um, headquarters and opened up a studio 10 years ago. And I went to Atlanta to DJ that. And Tina Turner saw me there and she turned 70 and um, flew me to Zurich, Switzerland to do her 70th birthday. And I DJ Jay-Z and Beyonce's wedding amongst dozens and dozens of other parties that they've thrown over the past 15, 20 years. And of course, Puffy was, was, was really um, the first person that helped to put me on the map. And I've DJed all of his parties throughout the past 15, 20 years. And Jennifer Lopez and Naomi Campbell, and the list goes on. Well, great. First of all, people don't usually like doing that. And yours, you know, like, I even forget that alone. You know, I kind of know all that, but when you say it, it's kind of, like, amazing. So, you know, kudos to you. That's uh, an amazing feat. And, you know, I think, too, that in general, people don't realize how hard DJs work. DJs, you know, are on a plane most of their life and work very hard. And I don't think people really realize that they just kind of see the – them at the party, you know? And I think DJs work extremely hard and people don't really realize that, but that's just, you know, hot. Yeah, for sure. And yeah. I, I think the majority of my hard work came before anyone ever saw me. Yeah. You know, the, 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 the years from age 10 to 20 when I didn't leave my bedroom I don't, I don't think in, in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, I don't think I had any social life other than the life that was defined by my identity as the DJ for all the fun parties. But I had no life beyond that. 
And I was very content with that. My parents bought me turntables and a mixer for my 10th birthday. And they decided to put the equipment at, at my father's house as a way to get me to want to go there on the weekends. And um, turned out I never wanted to leave. So I really locked myself in that room. And, and when I wanted to leave that room, it was to go um, shopping for records downtown New York City in the village um, to the house of oldies, bleaker bobs, um, rock and, and to shop for vinyl. Of course, rock yeah. and soul. That's where you went for the new shit, the new hip hop. Yeah. Um, so um, basically, how old were you when you started DJing? I was 10 years old. I asked my parents for turntables and a mixer for my 10th birthday. So well, I've been- I put in my, I'm putting on my glasses because you're wearing yours. Your, your what, glasses uh, are way cooler than mine. So I've been DJing for two thirds of my life. What was your first gig? You know, it's hard to say. I can tell you what, what kind of gigs they were. I, I certainly had been paid to DJ by the time I was 12. Um, and I was DJing kids' birthday parties, like Sweet Sixteens for girls when they were in 10th grade and I was in 7th or 8th. And I DJed all the girls' Sweet Sixteens and I DJed all the proms. And um, as kids started to throw parties in clubs in New York City, they would call on me. This was a different era of New York City when, when young kids got away with having... Um, underage parties at real legitimate um, um, nightclubs. They would somehow get these rooms at well-known clubs and yeah. they would throw parties in these rooms and... Somehow get these, these rooms, hello. It, exactly. Uh. And so that was really the beginning. And, you know, that really started at 12, 13, 14, 15 and progressed until the I end of high school. I don't, I don't think I ever knew that about you. Um, so... What was your first big gig? Then if you were doing these kind of like, you know, teenage party, what was your first big gig? So there were really three things that stick to mind when my life uh, started to change. Um, I interned for Tommy Hilfiger a couple summers during high school. And um, Andy Hilfiger, Tommy's younger brother, was extremely important in reaching out to the hip hop community and infusing um, their brand into hip hop yeah. um, fashion. And that came really through, uh, um, you know, through rappers like the Wu-Tang Clan and first through one of the greatest rappers ever, Grand Puba, who said, your yeah. bow's on the bottom, he'll figure on the top. Yeah. So he'll figure as a brand was really infused in hip hop. So for a young kid working at Tommy Hilfiger, it was really like working at a record label. At that because, time. At that, at that time, time, because yeah. all these rappers would come through the office and I would fold rugby's for Raekwon and for Q-Tip and for Pooba. And um, Andy Hilfiger was really the first person that took me out on the scene. And that was really important for me because I went from listening to DJs on the radio listening to mixtapes and hearing about DJs and reading about DJs, but not really hearing them at parties. Yep. And through Andy, I was exposed to that. And I think, I think that Andy, you know, it's funny because Andy's come up several times and he's, this is my 72nd talk, by the way. Um, Andy's come up several insane. times in these talks. And I think, he doesn't get enough credit for what he did culturally. You know, Andy was really, a lot of people have brought him up as kind of a, uh, you know, showing them the ropes kind of fat person. So Andy. And there was, uh, there was a third person to that mix. So it was Tommy Hilfiger, Andy Hilfiger, and Peter Paul Scott. I, yeah, yeah, exactly, Peter Paul, yeah. And the three of them really took me under um, their wing as an intern, and I got to see Funk Master Flex DJ for the first time with them. Yeah. I got to see Stretch Armstrong DJ for the first time with them. I got to see Mark Ronson DJ for the first time. I got to see Kid Capri DJ for the yeah. first time with them. Yeah. And in fact, one party comes to mind, and I think the person, other person who's involved in the story is on here right now, Sade. Um, 
So Sade was a friend of mine whom I went to school with, and she was four years older than me. She was in my sister's grade. And we had a mutual love of hip hop culture. And so Andy Hilfiger and Peter Paul brought me to an Andre Harrell white party at Tavern on the Green in New York City. And I was 14 years old. That is Sade. Sade, I love you. And, hey, Sade. We love you. And my mother said I could go and stay out late if Sade went with me because Sade was four years older. She was like my sister. She was another sister to me. And so Sade and I went with Peter, Paul, and Andy to Andre Harrell's white party at Tavern on the Green. And I remember watching Kid Capri tear that dance floor up. I remember him playing the Lost Boys. It, it's the Jeeps, the Lex Coops, the Beamers, and the Benz. To all my ladies and my men's. And I saw Andre on the mic, and he was just orchestrating. And he was the maestro. And I looked at that whole scene and said, that's what I want to do. I'm going to rock these parties one day. And I remember that moment vividly. Yeah. Um, that's amazing. First of all, I had no idea Sade was instrumental in any of your nightclub experiences. Shout out to Sade. She's another one. She's another one people don't, you know, she's another cultural, Sade has to come on here for sure, but she's another cultural navigator kind of, um, you know, and, and people don't, or I didn't yeah. know that story. So, um, yeah, Sade will have you on for sure. So, okay. So, so the Hill figures were that first, that first, they were one of three. But yeah. they were really that first kind of change from aspiring DJ in my high school to something bigger. And of course, they gave me some of my first few breaks. Peter Paul hired me to DJ a Britney Spears fashion show in Canada. They were flying me to Canada outside the country. And Britney Spears How old was, were you? I was 18 and Britney Spears was 18 and she was just breaking and... It was so exciting for me, and I had no business being there. And uh, they saw something in me, Tommy, Andy, and Peter. And uh, thank God for them. So that was yeah. really the first time I can remember getting out of my small world yeah. into the bigger world. Um, so, okay, so... Was Central, what was, was Halo before Central Fire? So the next step, that brings me to what you just asked. So the next step was a guy named John Lennon, who's now known as Johnny Lennon. But to me yeah. back then, he was John Lennon. Yeah. And John Lennon was a fixture in New York City nightlife at the time. If you were anyone cool in nightlife, you were down with him. If you were a DJ, you did his parties. If you were a cool DJ, I mean, you did his parties. And like the Hill figures, he took me under his wing. And he had a co-promoter at the time named Vegas. Um, do you remember Vegas? Of course. Yeah, Vegas is still around. Vegas, if you're watching or if you see this, I love you. And John and I are still extremely close to this day. Vegas, I see every now and then. And they saw something in me, too, that... I want to say I saw him myself, but I'm not sure at that time if I even did. Yeah. And, and they were promoting the hottest parties in New York. So they were involved in Sunday nights at Chaos with Bill Spector. I, I couldn't get on that. Really? I did the yeah. So that was a hot party. One night it was Flex. One night it was Mark. I never got on to that. that was, I, was just really, I was really going there with them to kind of – to kind of watch what was going on and for them to say to people, this is our new DJ, Cassidy. So the first party they put me on to was Friday nights at Float. Float was on 51st between Broadway and 8th. If you watch the Nas and Puffy video for... Yep. Um, hate Me Now. Yeah, Hate Me Now. It's shot at Float. And I did the VIP room upstairs. The main room was all um, house music. And I did the VIP room. I didn't start till two in the morning. But it was the first time that there were famous people in a room where I DJed. And I was so gassed by that experience. I had a notepad. And every night when I got home to my mom's house, because I lived with my mom till I was 24, every time <laughs> I got home to my mom's, I would write down the famous people. And it was like random people. I remember writing down Most F. I remember writing down Ice-T, Christina Aguilera. Um, 
And it was so exciting. Uh, um, it was so exciting to me, not because um, they were stars, but them being stars meant to me that 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 the place that I was at was legitimate. Yeah, I understand. It made me feel. Um, it made me feel like I was being um, kind of solidified in a way. And then after that party at Float, they put me on to another party. And that was Wednesday nights at Central Fly on 21st between 5th and 6th, which was a big block for clubs. Cheetah was on that block. Justin's was on that block, right? Mm -hmm. I, worked and, at, I worked that entire block. I worked at Cheetah, Justin's, and Central Fly. And so there were two people who did the door at this party at Central Fly. Now, I want to say it was 99, but it actually wasn't. This was now the summer of 2000. And there were two people who did the door. One was named Allison Melnick, who's still killing it in the nightlife world, who's a friend of yep. mine and a friend of yours. Yep. And the other person was you. Yeah. And I don't think that you were legendary Damon yet, were you? Correct. I was just Damon at that point. You were just Damon. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this party after float made me feel like I had certainly arrived. It was also a VIP room. A lot of the main rooms at the big clubs in that day were, 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 were um, essentially house music with an occasional off night. So the VIP rooms were where you got to play hip hop and soul and funk and disco and anything you wanted. And the music you heard in the VIP rooms in that day was very diverse. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to get out of my bubble of high school and play diverse music. And so suddenly I was in my second hot spot because of John Lennon in Vegas. And you were running the door. And I remember we always laugh about this story, but there was one regular customer who came every week and her name was Tracy Bingham. She was a Baywatch babe. She was on Baywatch with Pam Anderson and she the thought I was- girl, The brown girl from Baywatch, yes, right? And she thought I was so adorable and so cute and I was 18 and I looked like I was eight and I just thought she was the hottest girl I'd ever seen in my life because I had never seen a woman like that in person. To me, it was like Baywatch. And she would come over to me and she would say, I love this song. And she would like kiss me on the cheek, but it was like close to the lips. And I just got so excited by it. And I, I, rem I remember that like it was yesterday. So that was another, that was another well, step. The story, you're not telling the story right at all, first of all. So I did the door, you DJed, we met, we got along great. I loved your DJing. She started coming, I became friends with her. And you had basically had like a swing for her. You were like, oh my God, Tracy Bingham. And I was like, I'll introduce you, which I did. Oh, and oh then, you brought her. Yes, I brought her. And I, I knew you had a crush on her. So I brought her to you to introduce you to her. You mean? Oh, I don't think I knew that it was your doing. Okay. We, we've been talking about that story for 20 years in that way. But anyway. Oh, so, um, okay. I guess so, I'm on the spot now. You know, I'm nervous. I'm on your show. I'm not getting it's the okay. facts right. You'll be okay. So my thing is, I thought Halo was before, but it's not, right? No, Halo's hmm. another okay. step. So, okay, so that's our first, you know, uh, getting to know each other was Central Fly, me doing the door, you DJing, and, and John let me Lennon. say this, and let me say this. Um, that world was, for me, in a sense, very intimidating. I always had a lot of confidence. Yeah. But, but, but I went from DJing kind of small world parties yeah. to... Um, really being thrown into the big leagues and John Lennon and Vegas and Allison Melnick and you really made me feel secure. Got you, it. you all, um, you, you all just kind of overwhelmed me with love and encouragement and look how good could I have been? You know, I always say this to people. I'm like, what makes you great as a DJ is experience. There's no way you can, you can practice this in your bedroom and then leave one day and be great. Well, you know, all four people you mentioned, you know, Vegas and myself, John and Allison, we recognize authenticity. So I'm sure I remember liking your DJ sets back then. You know, in my brain, I remember it that way. But the reality is I think we just recognize your authenticity. And that's what we were probably resonating with, all of us, because we all are very keep it real type people, you know, that whole, all four of us. So I think that's probably what it was. We, we recognize your authenticity and that's what we were celebrating. Yes, for. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. And just so you people watching can get an idea, I'll just give you a couple songs that were hot. Like when I was doing Central Fly that summer, Lucy Pearl Dance Tonight was hot. Michael, uh, um, uh, um, what else? Um, uh, Get It On Tonight by Montel Jordan, remix featuring L O Cool J. What about Vibrant? Um, was it was a Vibrant thing kind of good? Around vibrant the time? thing. Aaliyah, Try yeah. Again. So I remember, Lucy I remember a Vibrant thing being like the song because we did his birthday. Did we do his birthday there? Q Tip. I'm not sure, but these songs they either came out that summer or the summer before but they were still hot. But that was the era. It was like vibrant thing, breathe and stop, um, you know, dance tonight, try again. And, you know, those were the cool records. And it was just, you know, um, a really exciting time. Whenever I hear, um, um, I heard one of those records the other day in the car and it just kind of brought me to, to you know, to, to that night, to that place. Well, Central Fly and that specific time in New York was great. I remember that party, Mary J. Blige coming there. I remember because it was kind of a smaller party that we had here, which I liked. And it was really ne real New York in a great way, that party. Um, I really liked that party. It was short lived, though. It was about a year or something, right? It wasn't that long. Yeah, it was a year. Float, the party that I came from before, was about so, a year. So then I remember what I vividly remember you is Halo. I remember kind of hanging out in the DJ booth with you a lot. And that was Sunday nights. And that to me, for sure, I remember you being a good DJ because, you know, I would say I'm no matter what's happening in, in any room I'm in, I'm always listening to the DJ at all times. But I remember kind of loving your DJ sets at Halo in particular and kind of being in the DJ booth and like having a great time because the music was so good. So and that party was very unique and very special. Also, whose party was that? That was Maurice and Rich Burroughs. And Maurice passed away a few years ago. Mm hmm. And like the Hill Figures and like John Lennon, Maurice and Rich, I believe, were recommended me uh, by uh, John Lennon. I think they asked him for a recommendation for someone to fill in. And somehow the night ended up mine. So Sunday nights at Halo in the West Village became my first night that was truly mine. Yep. It was probably my favorite club night I've ever done in my life. It was the first club night of mine that ended up in a song. In Jermaine Dupri's Welcome to Atlanta remix, Puffy says, Sunday we lay in low at Halo, sipping Chris and we straight. Mondays we go to Bungalow 8. Tuesdays we at spa, drunk doing the shake, and for the rest of the week we go follow the freaks. When he said Sundays we lay in low at Halo, sipping Chris and we straight, I had already started to DJ for him. So that all happened around the same time. And I can tell you about that. But Halo was my first home. It was the first place that I kind of defined the sound of. And um, I became synonymous with that party. People came you to see the, me, I got, think. It was, you had the freedom to fletch. You had the freedom to do, to do you for the first time, I guess. I, I didn't know that. This is the first time I'm hearing it. But I remember, like I said, that party was great. I remember loving the music in particular. And it was a small, hot New York party. It was amazing. Yeah, it was like a loft, but it was um, underground. You walked down a flight of steps, and it was like velvet suede couches, and everyone stood on couches. There was no dance floor. It was really a lounge that we popped then, off into a club. I used and to it, go was, there. it was the most exciting thing for me to have a night that was mine. And I could, you know, uh, uh, um, I could really sculpt the sound of it. It wasn't about what do people want to hear. I was defining the sound of the party. And I love Maurice and I love Rich for giving me that opportunity. And that really was kind of step three. Um, I don't know if you want me to go to step four. I'll let you lead the way on that. Well, I was saying, because I used to go there every Sunday, and then I started a party at Lotus on Sundays that I ended up doing for seven years. So. Yeah, so that was two years in, and you stole a lot of our thunder. We were kind of, after two years, we were kind of losing a bit of the steam, because I don't think, you know, it's hard for a party to stay hot for three, four, five years. And after a two-year heavy span, you and Frank Roberts, who is watching, hi, Frank. Um, yep. You guys started kind of the continuation of that party and eventually Halo stopped and you guys at Lotus took it over. And then at Lotus, but not at your party, is where kind of step four came of my career. Which is what, the Wednesday? No, so I was doing a random night at Lotus. Um, this might have been 
after I had started Halo, but had nothing to do with it. But it was around the time of starting Halo, after the Hill Figures, after John Lennon. Yeah. And I was kind of just dying to DJ a Lotus. It was the new hot spot. And for those who are familiar with New York City, this was the only club in the meatpacking. You would still walk around meatpacking and see meat hanging oh, yeah. out Smell. of the warehouse. Smell. Yeah. There was, there was only Jeffries, Pastis, and Lotus. Nothing else for years. You mean? Yeah. So I was dying to DJ Lotus. Yeah. Jeffrey Ja, David Raven. So someone gave me some night downstairs. None of the cool people went downstairs. <laughs> And it, was, and it was pouring rain. I had DJed an empty club the whole night. And around three in the morning, I see someone walk out of the corner of the room. And it was puffy. And I was playing the soul music of the 70s and 80s. Michael Prince, Stevie, Luther, Frankie Beverly. I could go on. You get the point. And Puffy danced alone for two hours. And I remember the manager coming up to me at four saying, I'm assuming you want to keep going. And I'm like, yeah. Puffy was the king in New York City. This was like, you know, had my heart beating. And at five in the morning, he walks out with an entourage that had been somewhere in the shadows. And they all walked in. And he stopped by the DJ booth and he said, where's the DJ? And I said, I'm the DJ. <laughs> and he said, who's been playing all these old records? And I said, me. And he took a napkin and a pen from the DJ booth and wrote down his number on a napkin and said, call me tomorrow, Playboy. And so the next day I went to class. I was a sophomore at NYU living with his mother. And in between classes, <clears throat> I went to Dojo. Do you remember Dojo, the restaurant? On, okay. And I found a quiet table and I called the number and I got a voicemail. It said, God is the greatest. Beep. Well, I never stammered my, uh, I never stammered my way through a voice message um, as much as I did then. And I said, you know what? Okay, that was cool. Whatever. I'm not getting yeah. through to him. I'll meet him again. I go to class. I come back out and I have a voicemail from Cheryl uh, from at the time was Cheryl Fox Spencer, or maybe she was just Cheryl Fox at the time. And she said, I'm calling for Sean Puffy Combs. Please call us back. Well, I race home to my mom's. I say, mom, you call back, leave me alone, lock myself in the room, call the number back. And I said, hi, it's DJ Cassidy. And they said, hold on, please. And he gets on the phone and he goes, playboy. He said, how old did you say you were? And I said, 18. And he said, you're white, right? I said, yeah. He said, I've never seen a white boy play soul music like that before in my life. And he said, I'm throwing a party for the MTV Awards next week. Do you want to do it? And a week later, I was playing P. Diddy's party for the MTV Awards in front of every important person in music that you could ever imagine. And that was the beginning of the next phase of my life. Where was it? Where was that party? It was at Tau on 58th Street. It had just opened. And what year was that, 2002 or something? 2001. It was the release party for the Saga Continues slash the party for the MTV Awards. So I'm talking NSYNC, Backstreet Boys, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Nelly, Ja Rule, Dr. Dre, Eminem, Russell and Kimora. This is who was in the room at my first big party. And that was probably August 2001, right before September. All, the last week of August or the first yeah. week of September? Yep, because, yeah, interesting. Um, oh, it was it's, 2000. I don't feel uh, like September 11th was right after. It was, I don't know, whenever the saga continues came out. It was 2000 or 2001. We started Lotus shortly after 2011. We started Lotus in November of 2001. Um, anyway, so I had Damon DeGraff on here, and he was saying an interesting kind of thing, you know, how everyone kind of, all you guys. Uh, Wait, is Damon DeGraff um, on the chat? I don't know. I didn't see him join, but he was on here about two weeks ago. And he was saying it was kind of the timing of everything is that, you know, Lizzie Grebman was kind of doing these huge events and, you know, he was the only one kind of managing DJs. And it was like, you know, the timing of you and Mark and Beverly Bond and everybody was a really good timing thing for these, you know, for, and Ruckus for the DJs to becoming these like, you know, at the time too. So I think that that plays a key role in like the story a bit 
is the timing of it all. Don't you, don't you agree? A hundred percent. I mean, I think stars aligning are 50% of everything. Yeah. Um, I would like, uh, if you'd be so kind to allow me to backtrack for one second. <laughs> um, I talked about the Hill figures and I talked about John Lennon and um, I talked about Maurice and Rich and then I talked about Puffy. But there was one step that I missed in between John Lennon and Halo, which was Damon DeGraff. Yep. So uh, while I was working for Andy, um, Hilfiger was having a fashion show and they brought me to the fashion show and the stage had two DJ setups on it. So if you can picture a stage for a fashion show, the models would come out. On the left side was a DJ setup for Mark Ronson and on the right side was a DJ setup for Q-Tip. Well, I was backstage with my boss, Andy Hilfiger, and someone said, Q-Tip hasn't arrived yet. The show starts in 15 minutes. We can't have an empty DJ setup. So they said, Cassidy, we're dressing you. You're going to go on stage with Mark and fake it. Too late to teach you the songs. Just fake it. Got all dressed. My heart was beating. And in the ninth inning, Q-Tip showed up. So I didn't go on stage. But the reason I'm telling this story is because Mark introduced me to his manager, Damon DeGraff. And he said, this is my friend Cassidy. He's a DJ. I know him through the Hill figures. I must have said a few words to Damon. Well, the next day my phone rang and it was Damon DeGraff. And Damon said, hey, I manage a few DJs, Mark Ronson, his sister, Samantha, and a third DJ, Beverly Bond, who I believe is on this chat right now. So I think if you're watching Beverly, I love you. But we love you very much. You're next. And, you're going to tell us next. And he said, I'd like to manage you. I said, you haven't even heard me. He said, I trust Mark. Now, the irony is Mark hadn't even heard me either. So uh, he went out on a limb. And, um, and that was also another phase of my career. And the reason I didn't tell that in chronological order was because he was such a part of 10 years of my life. Yeah. Whereas Halo was two. And the John yeah. Lennon clubs at the beginning was one. Yeah. Of course, my relationship with John continued, but those early clubs were one year. Yeah, I get it. And, um, and my relationship with Damon um, um, really um, shaped my career as a DJ um, for the first 10 years. Well, he, the point that he was bringing up, which, you know, of course we were all experiencing it in real time, is that, you know, that it was the birth of, you know, all of it, like hip hop, they were, you know, Puffy and all them were becoming these mega stars. Everybody, everything was like, like exploding kind of right before our eyes. And he was saying it was a timing thing too for all the people, including Mark and yourself. And everybody was kind of, um, it was just, like you said, all the stars aligning and people were blowing up in the fact that like they had these massive events that they needed these kind of then, you know, name DJs. It's kind of like, you know, young, cool, hip hop, superstar DJs. So, you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, the energy of New York City um, it, um, in my lifetime has always been dictated by hip hop. Yes. And when hip hop energy left New York City, the energy left New York City nightlife. It's a very good point, you're right. Well, and, and when yeah. Bad Boy and Rockefeller were running New York City and running hip hop, the energy in New York City nightlife was unparalleled. And for me to be coming up as a DJ during the reign of Bad Boy and Rockefeller was pure timing, that was luck. I could have grown up 10 years earlier, 10 years after. But um, Puffy and Jay had such an impact on my life and their support and their co-signing of me and my career um, um, made such a difference in who I am today. I probably would not be sitting here talking to you without them. And, um, and that was timing. Yeah, no, you, know, the, the, you know, besides the you know, teenage stuff, you pretty much became very successful from the jump. You know, you, from the minute you started teaching in New York City nightclubs, then how, how far was it from Halo to Puffy? Like a year or something, right? I mean, it was the same time. He would come, yeah. you know, um, he might have been coming before he saw me at Lotus, you know, and maybe he noticed the first time. I don't think so. I think he saw me the first time at Lotus, but it was, then he started coming to Halo every Sunday. It was all in a one or two year time span. Yeah. Was... Because I would say, too, I remember doing the door at Cheetah, you know, Puffy was, 
the king, literally the king of New York. And Jay-Z was still kind of like a rapper, but he was like, you know, up and, you know, I'm becoming, but, you know, on his way up. And he would come with too many guys. And I would tell him, you know, we can't do all the guys. And, and that was fine. He was cool with that, you know, in the, in a certain time. And then, you know, all of a sudden, two or three years later, Jay-Z is now the king of New York too. You know, it's like, it's really interesting how, um, you know, that was just a great, amazing time in New York City. And then speaking of Cheetah, um, Adam Lublin and AJ Calloway threw the parties at Cheetah on yep. Friday nights and Saturday nights. Yep. And um, Envy on Wednesdays. Yep. And those were the dopest hip hop parties in the world. You know, when Jay Z says Club Cheetah and Club Amnesia. And through more recent Rich at Halo, I was recommended to Adam and AJ. So this was all kind of, you know, a train, you know, um, from John Lennon to Maurice and Rich to Adam and AJ to Lotus. And Adam and AJ were throwing these parties and DJ Gofinger was playing and Funk Master Flex was playing. And to have little old me be a substitute one night was just crazy. And then I ended up with a regular night there and I ended up playing those parties for quite um, a while and really like gained so much credibility by doing those parties. And I had no business doing them. And so Adam and AJ were another step. And so all these steps, the Hill figures, John Lennon. And you were like, what, like 20 at the time? How old were you at this time? Yeah, this was all 18, 19, 20, 21. So from the Hill figures to John Lennon, to Maurice and Rich, to Adam and AJ, to Lotus, to Puffy, this was all between 18 and 21. And then, you know, came the rest of my life. So it's funny because um, Ruckus was on here a couple of weeks ago and he was spinning Lotus when he was 17. He did your Lotus party that took over from my Halo party. You yep, guys he shut my head. Yep. Okay, and he, so, was, he was the yeah. only person that was younger than me. Um, okay, so you're 21 now. You become this successful DJ. And, you know, so what are some of the things you're doing? Like these, then all of a sudden you're doing all these huge events. And, you know, to me, you, you know, you started doing events more than even nightclubs at the time. You were just this like huge event, you know, amazing DJ. What are some of the things you were doing for those 10 years, let's say? Briefly, I mean, not <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was, it was such a whirlwind, you know? I mean, yeah. the, 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 the next major person that came into my life after Puffy was um, Jennifer Lopez. And, um, you know, her and Benny Medina were exposed to me through Puffy parties. Yep. And then and Benny called me in 2001. And um, I barely knew him, if at mm -hmm. all. And he said, do you want to DJ Jen's wedding? And she was marrying Chris Judd. And this was right after September 11th. And my family was like, you're not getting on a plane a week after September 11th. And I'm like, I will drive to Los <laughs> Angeles if I have to. And I don't drive. Yeah. And, I, and I went to Los Angeles to DJ Jennifer Lopez's wedding. And I came back on a Sunday and I DJed Halo that Sunday. And I felt like my world changed. And it yeah. really did. My world changed. It's like I got off the plane and I became someone different. Yeah. Um, 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 strictly by doing her wedding. And so she was another person who to this day, I just DJed her 50th birthday last yep. July. Yep. And so she's been, um, you know, so supportive my entire career. And then of course, Jay and Beyonce, you know, I remember getting a call from Norma, who was Puffy's right hand um, at the time. And I had DJ Puffy's white party in the Hamptons and said, I gave your number to Jay. And and Jay called me to DJ a, I think it was a birthday for Beyonce was the first one, but then countless Beyonce birthday parties, countless yeah. Jay-Z birthday parties, countless openings of the 4040 Club in every city, Atlantic City, yeah. um, was it Atlantic City? Yeah, Atlantic City, Las Vegas, New Year's, countless. And then of course I got the call to do their wedding and, um, you know, I mean, that's, it's just, there's no words. It's the two greatest icons of our time uh, got married and I was in the room. Forget did that you, I was. Did they get married in New York? Yeah, in their apartment. Yeah. yeah. And, um, you know, it was extremely small and, you know, there was no footage out there for a very long time. Now there's footage. And I just watched that footage and I'm like, I can't believe I was in the room. 
you know, know. and and um, and you know, Jay went on a stadium tour, Legends of the Summer tour, Justin Timberlake and Jay Z, and asked me to play for them, and um, I went on tour with them, fourteen stadiums across the country, and I had an hour set right before they came on, and just he's done you know, so much for my career as well. And um, Oprah, you know, and Obama, and just the list kept growing of these, of these just, um, well, these like there... culturally defining people um, that, that just continue to um, enter my life. And it never got less uh, surreal ever. Well, two things. So there's that photo you're spinning. I feel like it's a Met Ball after party and yeah. Oprah's in it and Pharrell. Who else? Yeah, you know, that's the greatest party I've ever done. It's also one of the greatest photos. For you, it's a defining photo of your whole legacy, I think. But it's Oprah, Pharrell. Who else is in it? So it's the Met Gala after party hosted by Oprah Winfrey and Anna Wintour at the Mark Hotel in a room that holds 100 people. Yep. And there was a banquette behind me only because the restaurant couldn't remove the banquette. It was stapled to the wall. And a little DJ set up in front of the banquette. And behind me is Puffy, Usher, Pharrell, Justin Timberlake, Naomi Campbell, Oprah, and Anna Wintour. And also yeah. Donna Karen and Kerry Washington. And, yeah. and it's, it's, there's like a roll of 100 photos from that night that are like the best pictures that I could ever be in possibly in my entire life. No, it's an it's it's amazing photo that documents history, literally. So, um, and then, uh, okay, so I wanna talk about obviously what's coming up, but uh, I don't wanna shorten, you know, your lengthy career. No, 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 career. please, I love this. I mean, however, however, however you wanna um, play. But, you know, me. the reality is, you know, I was thinking about you and I was like, you know, there are some amazing things that you have done um, that we have in common. I'm like, you know, we have some things in common. We both um, do these lavish big birthdays. So, um, you know, I think we kind of parallel each other in that way. You know, I love a big birthday. I know you do too. And I know why I do them, but why do you do them so grand? Well, so I'd be curious to hear why you do, but I, 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 from age 20 to 30, for those who are not familiar, um, I threw these just over the top yearly summer birthday parties in New York. And they grew and grew and grew. And Josie Sejour, who's watching, was always, he was the guy that would go two hours before it started just kind of to see what's what, get the tables right, make sure I was on point. Josie. Love you, um, Josie. And just a 30 second tangent, Josie used to get me into clubs, you know, um, I would want to go see Mark play and I couldn't get into the club. So I would call Josie from the corner. I'd be like, I'm here. And he'd come down to get me in. I couldn't get in anywhere. And one way I used to get into clubs was I would carry around an empty crate of records. You know, that, you know so um, I would take all my records out of a metal crate. So I used to carry six crates of records to DJ, six to eight crates of records. I would empty one and go to a club holding an empty crate. Because if the door guy saw you with crates, they thought that you were there to DJ. And if you came at 1 a.m., they were like, oh, the closer's here. So that's how I got into clubs. That's a side note. So, <laughs> I, th I, mentality. so I threw these birthday parties with no intention of them becoming big. I guess when I started them, it was like half for the same reason anyone throws a birthday party and half, I guess, like as a marketing tool. I just thought it was a good idea to invite all my clients and my colleagues and, you know, just a way to kind of, you know, to put my flag in the sand. Um, and the other half was just for the same reason anyone, you know, has a birthday party to celebrate. But they grew and they started growing really at my 24th. My 24th birthday, I threw at Butter, which was owned at the time by Scott Sartiano and Richie Akiva. Yeah. And Richie Akiva had Butter before One Oak and um, all the other clubs you know him for owning. I think this was the first place that they owned. And um, it was a restaurant and club and, and they gave me the whole club, the upstairs, the downstairs was closed for the night. And my DJs were Mark Ronson and Q-Tip. And there were no performers. 
and their chemistry and the energy in the night was something you just had to be there to experience. Yeah. It was, I remember Richie, um, I remember Richie's dad strangling him outside of butter out of anxiety because the floor on the upper level was actually caving in to the bottom floor. The ceiling was going in. It was just one of those, um, it was just one of those nights. And then starting the year after, I would surprise people with legendary hip hop stars um, that I admired as a kid. So in my first one, I surprised people with Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh. And, then I, su- and then I surprised people with Naughty by Nature and Big Daddy Kane. And then I took it bigger. Then I went to Chip Riani and I surprised people with Rakim and Bobby Brown. And then I went bigger. Oh no, Chip Riani was KRS-One and Belle Biv DeVoe. And then I went bigger to the New York Public Library and yeah. surprised people with Rakim um, and Bobby Brown. And then I culminated at my 30th at the Intrepid, which for those who aren't familiar, that's a warship parked outside of the West Side Highway in the Hudson River in New York City. And I reunited all six members of New Edition at that party. And it was Ricky Bell, Ronnie DeVoe, Michael Bivens, Ralph Tresden, Johnny Gill, and Bobby Brown for the first time in seven years. That was one of the greatest nights of my life. I've been, I went to all, all those parties, by the way. And they were, they're all amazing and special and such New York, classic New York moments. Um, and, I, you know, they're just uh, great cultural New York moments, basically. That's the best way to describe it as a patron of the party. So, um, uh, uh, um, And you throw equally over the top in um, um, extravagant and iconic um, um, annual parties for your birthday. And as someone who did it for many years, I salute you because it's not easy. People don't appreciate how hard it is to gather all your friends. You know, like the, um, the real thing that makes the party special are not the celebrities and are even maybe not the performers, but or the fact that you or I or who's ever at the center of the party bring together this kind of unique um, kind of melting pot of people. And it's that, you know, it's that that makes it special. You're right. It's very and, and I feel that at your parties. You can feel the love um, in the air. That's not created by a performer. That's created by you, the host. Right. I've always said that two things about birthdays and I want to talk about other things. So we have to stop. Um, it, it doesn't matter who's not there. It matters who is there. And then also it, it never, that's a good, that's a good quotable. Yes. And you always think it's about if, you know, Sierra or Beyonce is going to come and all these things in the end, it's not about that. It's about the people, you know, you like you said, the New York people that are there for you. It's not, it's not, it doesn't end up being about the celebrities that you're not friends with. You know, that it's um, like, I was just going to say, unless the celebrities are there for you and then they matter yeah, just as much. Unless you're close but it's, it's never about, and there's a lot, you know, like that, this, you know, this big celebrity is supposed to come, et cetera. That, that doesn't matter ever in the end. Okay. So we have 10 minutes left. And the whole reason that we're even doing this is okay, so you <laughs> did something um, we need a two-hour version of this. I know. We can go later. We can go and end after one hour. We can, we can join again if you want to. We can go longer. But, okay, so you did something about a month ago, right? Yes, July 2nd. It was called Pass the Mic, and you know because we've spoken about it. It was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. I told you it wasn't just the most amazing thing I've seen during quarantine. It's amazing, period. So <laughs> it's you. so innovative. It's Thank the you. most innovative thing I've seen virtually during uh, quarantine for sure. Wow. And it's such an amazing, unique, uh, special thing that uh, I know how passionate you are about these things and how much work went into that. Basically, I'm gonna tell quickly what it was. You were DJing your set and then every song you played, the artist came and sang the song. So it was, it was like one after another after another. It was Earth, Wind & Fire, it was Bobby Brown, it was um, Ray Parker Jr., it was Sherelle, it was Saida Garrett, it was, unbelievable to me to you and you know because i called you how excited i was about it and you're doing another one this wednesday um and it's called pass the mic and you basically it's on twitch but you can go on your instagram and just click the link correct you don't have to have twitch to watch it correct yeah so before we talk about it the link to twitch will be in my bio yes and you do not need an account or any login to view it. You click the link and it brings you to a video and you watch it. If you want to engage in the chat room, 
then you need a login, which of course takes 30 seconds to create. And I will say this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lead this part of it. This was amazing, you guys. I can't say it enough. I was, I called you, I, we talked several times about it. It's something, cause you, can, you can't see it again, or how, how does that work? You can just see it that one time? Yeah, or? so, no, so it's on my Instagram and my YouTube. That's where it lives after the live event. Oh, it's on Instagram right now? Yes, it's on my Instagram and my YouTube and has been yeah. since that night. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay, because I keep stressing my friends they need to watch it this Wednesday or they're going to miss it. Oh, yeah, I'll send you the link. You're doing old school hip hop or what's, what's the name this time? So for Pass the Mic Volume 2, I wanted to unite my heroes of hip hop. And so I made a list of my favorite iconic hip hop records of all time with no years in mind. Yep. But they all fell between 1984 and 1992. Makes sense. So... I don't announce the artists in advance, but I can tell you that if they had an important record during that time span, if there's a record that you loved from that time span, if there's an iconic hip hop song from that time span, chances are you're going to see them on Pass the Mic Volume 2. And I don't, can wa I don't want to know anything. I've told you several times, but how many, can we say how many people, how many songs or no? So last time the actual past the mic was about 25 uh, minutes with about 16 artists 16. in this volume. And I have not said this number, but I'm going to say it for you, Damon. There, you don't have, I don't, okay. No, I'm going to say it. there are approximately three dozen artists. And I, I, um, can only tell you that the past 21 days of my life have been surreal beyond words. Yep. The, the, the kid who worked for Andy and the yep. kid that DJed for John and for Maurice and Rich and Adam and AJ and Lotus and whose parties you did the door for and who was so in awe of the call from Puffy and that... That, that, that kid is exactly who I am today. And I am most starstruck by my heroes of hip hop. Yep. And I hold them on the highest pedestal there is. I would not be who I was today without them. They defined who I am, the music I listened to, how I danced, how I walked, how I talked, how I dress, how I thought, how I fought. And uh, spending 21 days interacting with them on Zoom was uh, maybe the greatest 21 days of my entire life. Amazing. And, um, no, it's, it, listen, people don't miss it. I want to see it. I'm not doing a, I'm not doing a uh, legendary talk that night, uh, Wednesday, on specifically because I want to see it when, in real time. I'm not doing my talk because it, for me, it's something that I'm very much looking forward to. Oh my to. God, you're not doing the talk to watch it? No, because it's, the same, it's at the same time. And I, I could, you know, in my head, I could watch it later. I didn't realize I could, but it doesn't matter because I want to experience it in real time. I don't, I won't let, I don't know anything. Like I want to experience it in real time. Your, your phone call after Pass the Mic Volume 1 was um, really important to me. You know, to know that there were people who had an important part of my career from the beginning, you know, from the first days watching and loving it and really enjoying the moment really, really felt great. And um, this one's well, special. Look, if no one watched, yeah. this one is already really special, really near and dear to my heart. Um, and I'm just so excited. I mean, I kind of have the jitters because I worked, I, you know, I worked really hard. You know, on volume one, there was no expectation. No one knew no. what I was doing. It, it was like a little thing I was working on to be creative and, you know, to put a smile on a few faces. And so I didn't pound the pavement. It was like, I developed it. This was like this. And um, I'm just really excited for this one. And um, I partnered with a very special partner, Rock the Bells, which is L.O. Cool J's everything. Yes. And, shout, um, out, shout out LL, shout out Claudine, shout out Rock the Bells. We love them. And there's going to be some very cool things we do on rockthebells.com um, after uh, the show. The night yeah. after, the day after. Um, but it was a really great kind of partner for this because it's celebrating classic hip-hop. Yep. And if people don't know, Rock the Bells launched 
um, the, the Sirius radio station launched about a year and a half ago, or maybe two years ago, and they just launched their website, website. which is amazing. They have them, I was looking at it recently. They have so much like DJ equipment, boom boxes, amazing apparel. Uh, I have the Roxanne Roxanne t-shirt. It's a really an amazing. Yeah, it's really uh, cool. People, people yes. like you and I love that. You know, it's, it's great. It's for really like cool. That. And so, and so when I told them what I was working on, they were like, oh, we'd love, you know, to work with you on this. And they're just, you know, you know, like it was a perfect fit. You know, this really, you know, the whole series is to celebrate my heroes. Yep. And in celebrating my heroes to pay homage to the heroes around the world, fighting for us, fighting for health, fighting for freedom, fighting for justice. And that really was the inspiration. You know, how can I connect my heroes and celebrate them to thank the heroes around the world? Um, well, what the, after the first one, I remember thinking I was so proud of you for many reasons. But one, that, that's my good friend doing something that's so amazing, first of all. Um, you know, it was like, it was a, it was like, I was a fan of it, but you're also my good friend. So it was like, I was so proud of you for being so innovative, first of all, extremely innovative and articulating that, navigating that situation so technically perfect and beautifully in this like Instagram glitch world we live in. It was technically perfect. And um, also it was just to celebrate, like you said, to celebrate, you know, um, you know, the doctors and the nurses and the people protesting, you know, it was a, it was a celebration and that's the vibe that I got from it. You mean so? Um, I, I, you know, um, I set out to do that, to turn it into a celebration. And the fact that yep. you saw that really, really meant a lot. And when you called me right after, I was like, I think you were the first person I spoke to, the second person I spoke to. Always and, the first. And having, having you throughout my career as, as a fixture, yeah. has been an important thing. You know, people come and go. And, and you not only have been an important part of my career, but you've been a mainstay in so many careers, in so many DJs, club owners, promoters, artists, singers, rappers. So many people have come through, come through, come through your door, so to speak. Um, mm -hmm. And I really commend you for that. You know, you have, have, have continued to 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 uh um to to exude the art of celebration Thank which you. really is all um i ever try to do well you know I, I was thinking about us today too what we have in common is we both um love culture very much and we both celebrate culture basically as our career you know we celebrate culture and you know you and i both what i love about you and we have like two minutes left is that you uh, we can go longer if you want but uh, you are a fan of things, and as am I, and I love that you're a fan of things. And then you ended up getting to become friends with some of you know, your idols in life, which you know, I got to work with a lot of people that I was you know, obsessed with as a 10-year-old as well. And it's, it's an amazing feeling. You know, you know, and also, neither one of us, we're not too cool to, you know, for school to be like, you know, oh, yeah, it's, it's whatever. Both you and I are always so uh, grateful, I think, that we get to work with these amazing people that we have uh, been fans of for a long time. These and cultural, that's, yeah. And, and that's what inspired Pass the Mic. I was yeah. FaceTiming with my mentor, Verdine White of Earth, Wind & Fire, during the quarantine. His song came on my speakers. I got a shiver down my spine, and I said, yeah. how grateful am I am that I have relationships with so many of my heroes in music. Could I possibly give this feeling to people? Oh, wow. And through right. that, try to uplift all the heroes around the world. And that yeah. in itself was was the entire foundation of the idea. But because it's coming from such a pure place, that's why we're so well done and so successful and so well received because it's not, it's like you're not really, you're really not making it about yourself. You're making it about, you know, um, giving people a reason to feel good, you know? So that, that's why it's so successful, seriously. I tell all my heroes, I called Earth, Wind and Fire after that. I called Philip and I called Verdine and I said, no matter how close we grow as friends, you will always be my hero first. Yeah. I said, you're so my hero that I yeah. cannot uh, separate that from our yeah. friendship. Yeah. And I will always be your fan first because I hold you on such a high pedestal. I, can't, um, I cannot take you off that pedestal to see you as my friend first. You will always be my hero first. We have one minute left, but I, I agree. Like, you know, 
there's people that I'm, you know, very close friends with that are singers and these different things. And I would be a fan of theirs with or without us ever being friends. Okay, we have 30 seconds left. Do you want to go longer? It's up to you. Um, it's really up to you. I loved every minute of yeah, this. Yeah, I have Maybe a couple more should... questions. I have a couple okay. more questions. Okay. So I'm going to hang up right now. We're going to join right now, okay? All right, everyone come back. Come back, guys.